And uh, thank you all for being here. Um, one thing just to reiterate, because I know we're, we're speaking to CLF, but also the Structural Engineers Association, all three of us are structural engineers, um, but by training, doing different mixes of structural design and um, you know, LCA work or embodied carbon work, my backgrounds in structures and materials. And for many, many years, I was a structural program uh, project manager um, until um, about five years or so ago, I was able to transition to this uh, corporate-wide sustainability position in our firm. So uh, as Mike and Lauren mentioned um, in kind of talking a bit about uh, action and case studies, I'm gonna go through um, four basic high-level bullets. I'm gonna talk a little bit about EPDs and whole building LCA to set the stage for some of these comparative analyses that I'm gonna talk about. Then I'm going to share uh, three basic case studies from our practice, uh, each with a little different angle uh, as far as achieving a reduction. And then talk about our, uh, talk about SC 2050 tools that could be used and finally close with some of the actions that we've taken as part of our uh, commitment to SE 2050. We were one of the firms who signed up at the end of last year and we're working on uh, formalizing our ECAP and whatnot right now. So uh, as we get going, just a reminder about the different life cycle stages. You've seen this in both uh, Mike and Lauren's, but just to be thinking that as we you know, do anything, but in this case, build a building, build a structural frame, we're, we're taking something from nature and we're emitting something back. And uh, it's important to think that there's different steps and that when we make these comparisons, different documents and different data that we will use in these comparisons will include uh, different levels of these steps. You know, some stop after manufacturing and production. Other uh, methodologies do carry it through and use the best available data for construction impacts and end of life. And that's really, really important when we start talking about making comparisons. So with that, I'm just gonna start with EPDs and EPDs are where we really want to go and what we want to push uh, for making these comparisons because it will be supplier specific. But as far as the uh, level of data that's contained in, in the vast majority of EPDs, nearly all, though, though not all, they're generally what people would call A1 to A3 from the life cycle stages, but the product stage, what it takes to get it out of the gate and manufactured. The EPDs don't include impacts associated with construction process or use or end of life. That, that's really important and those aspects are important, those stages when making a comparison across systems. But uh, even with that, EPDs can be very, very helpful. Um, and that uh, specifically with concrete, and I, I brought in the, the CRMCA uh, industry-wide EPD as well, but the, um, the North American Concrete Trade Associations, the Ready Mix Associations, have done a great job creating industry-wide EPDs and getting for, uh, Ready Mix plants to participate, as well as creating the benchmark proportions, um, in, at least in, a, in the states, based on region for what typical mixes are based on strengths, uh, kind of what we see on the left. And then on the right, um, and I show centrals because they were the first to really have so many EPDs for their specific mixes but more and more ready mix suppliers every day are uh, doing their own EPDs. And that's really powerful. But there are some limits to that. And this is a, a screen clip from the EC3 tool from this, the intro splash screen showing uh, where the concrete EPDs are available. And I've kind of drilled into the one for the US. Uh, they, we have to talk to Phil at EC3 about getting one for the provinces, but um, he's got this shaded by county. So what this shows is that some areas, you know, Metro Seattle, the Bay Area, Southern California, have a great number of mixed specific EPDs. And when we think about this, this dark blue, um, you know, 250 mixes in uh, LA is, is good, but there's a lot more mixes that are used. So this is an important, uh, and, and I show this because it shows that through specification, we're pushing more and more suppliers to have EPDs. Um, it's definitely a work in progress, but also um, while this is where we want to be in the future, we are not uh, kind of uh, resigned to sit on our hands in the absence of mixed specific EPDs. There are things we can do. Um, and that kind of is where we can pivot to whole building LCA and using uh, whole building LCA tools um, to make these comparative, to do these comparative analyses as Lauren mentioned, uh, the example we'll talk about we're all driven by lead, but when we're doing whole building LCA, now we're not only looking at A1 to A3, but we're looking at um, other uh, 
stages of the life cycle, including construction, the use stage, with, which admittedly for the structure is generally pretty minimal. Uh, more uh, enclosure uh, reskins or re-roofs come into here, and then end of life uh, are, are all very important. And when we're doing LCA, you know, tonight with is CLF, uh, we are talking about embodied carbon or the embodied greenhouse gases, but um, it's important to remember that they are uh, a very important and urgent impact to consider, but there are other measures of air and water pollution and resource consumption to, to consider as we're looking at this. We don't want to have our, we don't want to be overly focused. We don't want to have uh, big blinders on. So I mentioned that the three case studies that I'm gonna, gonna share, those were all driven, the whole building LCA was driven as part of the project's lead pursuit. Two were very lead driven. Uh, the third one was driven, um, the project was doing lead, but it was pursuing lead as just a, a measuring stick to evaluate the other design decisions uh, that it was made in kind of an overall low carbon design. But uh, for the structural engineer, I will say, I think it's really important that now uh, that in the version four and 4.1 whole building LCA is in the main body of the rating system. This is kind of, I don't have the 4.1 salvaged uh, uh, bonus point on here, if you will. We can talk about that in the Q and A, but this is something for projects that are uh, pursuing lead or other sustainability rating systems that have this in here. They have LCA, which means they have embodied carbon, which means that somebody's gonna be talking about the structural system when they start to read this scope of, you know, getting a 10% reduction at the structure and enclosure. And it's really important that we as structural engineers show up to the lead charrette, that we speak up, and that we educate ourselves, that, that we're able to at minimum participate in this, but at many times it's an opportunity to, to grab it and lead it. Because um, the thought that I kind of want all of you to consider is, do you want to be influencing what you're changing in your specifications and your drawings? Or do you want somebody else just telling you that you need, need to change things? So as we can be proactive about this, we can actually um, have some, some great opportunities. Um, the, the basics of it are you know, almost simple. You get your quantities. And I know we all have our quantities in different ways to different degrees of fidelity, perhaps even within our firms and our different projects. But you know, something like a Revit model is a great place to pull them out. And then you can use an LCA tool. Uh, we use Tally and Athena. So those are the two I show here, but there's one click and some other tools, but an LCA tool, not just a supply chain accountability tool like EC3, there is a difference. And we can talk about that in Q and A. And then you, you do uh, perform comparative analyses to see where the hotspots are and to, to find some improvement. So with that, we'll step into our first of three case studies. The first one's uh, Oracle's a waterfront campus here in Austin. I'm based in Austin, Texas. Um, it's uh, one of the first buildings that Oracle, as they're moving uh, from the Bay Area to Austin, built. Um, and it's a, a tech office uh, pretty close to downtown Austin, built by Ryan with um, Keystone and Syntex as the uh, construction team. But it's a, about a half million square foot office space with a precast concrete garage and some subgrade parking that achieved lead gold and our local Austin Energy uh, Systems four star. Here's the, uh, the project as it's going up. I think this is what you get in Google Earth right now if you look at it. Um, but it's a, it's a concrete building and it's the type of construction that we do very frequently in the Southern US called a, a panform beam. Uh, it's a post-tensioned girder with a, um, with a, a rib system uh, going perpendicularly. And it's a moment frame laterally. Here's, here's the structural frame uh, kind of stripped out from, from the model. And I show this, I'll show some uh, shadings of carbon intensity on this later. But one of the things that when we talk about quantities and Lauren mentioned materials and understanding what was there, Mike talked about not having to put some new caissons in for that project. Um, a lot of people forget about the foundations and this is our, our estimate of, of our foundations. We didn't go through and kind of tweak every pier to show the actual length. But um, as structural engineers, we understand that a lot of times when we have our foundation drawings, we say go you know, so many meters into a certain strata of rock. But we don't say whether that's 10 feet down or whether that's 60 um, feet down. And sorry for my unit mixing. I'll try to, try to speak in meters, but I, I know I'll fall back to, to feet. But this is something that we understand. So there's a piece that we need to be thinking about. You know, it's not just however deep the 
the foundation might have been drawn in the Revit model that somebody holds, but it's, it's actually could be a lot of volume. So for this concrete building, uh, we use Tally. And here we see our, our first LCA results and our comparative result here. But for, for GWP, um, and if you're not familiar with Tally, the yellow is division three or the concrete. Um, you know, this, this building, the, the lead scope was dominated by the concrete. The pinks are the insulations, the blue are the glazings, um, the, the green is some of the cold form that was in a kind of ancillary structure. So from our analysis, we said, you know, this is, this is going to be a concrete story. And also, if we look over here, this deepest yellow is the cement. And we see what kind of Mike alluded to, that while a small portion of the mass, the cement's a large portion of the GWP. So the approach that this led us to was to really rethink, and a lot of this is about collaborative communication and getting the team together, but rethinking how the specification that we write and the choices that we make during design that we put into our documents and we hand off to our architect who goes through the owner and goes to the GC, to the concrete sub, back to the ready mix supplier. What we put in here dictates what they do and also the ready mix supplier gets our requirements and everybody else is stuck other things on top of them. So I'm gonna skip over here um, to show that really what we did here was we, we broke this wall down and we had a lot of collaborative meetings discussing what we needed from the concrete. And we were the ones putting the most requirements on, um, but the, uh, you know, working with the builder and schedule and other elements to understand what, what all these requirements were actually telling the mix designer at Sentex that they needed to do. And this seems, seems very, very basic, but it's actually um, super important because uh, this collaboration, um, we can lead to environmentally optimizing the mixes. This is that slide that I kind of jumped over, but coming back, um, you know, this is how we've, what we've put into our drawings in some places. This is not this job, but one that I could clip. Um, you know, people have thought about kind of requiring cement replacement, which is one way that a ready mix supplier might think of it. But I would uh, say that we really need to get to better environmental requirements. And we really need to get to saying, have, a, have an EPD that has a GWP limit per cubic meter or cubic yard. Um, though we have a uh, use cement content as a proxy in between for a discussion because um, not every ready mix supplier will have a cement, con uh, will have an EPD as I showed earlier, that um, using cement content as a proxy can be a way to uh, let some of the other suppliers participate. So then if we look at this project and we kind of look at a, a cutaway of that model that I showed earlier, we can look at it by the carbon intensity of the benchmark mixes that we measured against. And what's really important is we see, you know, even though all this concrete looks gray and the same, there's actually a big scatter in the embodied carbon. And then this image kind of shows where we made our reductions and how we came up or where the end uh, embodied CO2 changed. So one of the things I just point out here is because um, construction sequence drove when we needed to stress the tendons uh, all the way up the building. So we looked at what strength we actually needed to stress the tendons and how that could maximize or how we could minimize that to maximize uh, the environmental benefit. But also then in terms of time, once the team got to the upper floors, they didn't need as much time to build their false work to, to get on it. So we were able to use different mixes uh, at the top of the floors. And even um, there's a little bit more granularity that doesn't show up here. But if they had their cycle, they were able to give it uh, a few more days, they were able to use a less carbon intensive mix. So that um, here we've just shown it based on the percent reduction for the different elements. So we really didn't have a big reduction in many of the floors, but we pushed the substructure and the, the top two floors a lot harder to get those overall reductions. And there's uh, that project uh, as built. The next project um, is a uh, 100,000 square foot or so um, office building for a hospital outside of Los Angeles. Um, this is a project that um, you know, had whole life carbon considerations, is seeking lead gold, um, designed by Gensler um, and uh, owned by City of Hope. But the idea here, the other parts of this project that you can see is a lot of the circulation, uh, back if you can see my pointer, you can see a lot of the circulations outside. Um, the roof is covered with PV panels. The EUI, it's electrified with a, not a super low EUI, but I think it's in the 40s, 
but uh, it's all electrical with a high percentage of PV and on the California grid. So this idea of whole life carbon came up, which led to doing LCA for this concrete framed office building. Uh, and the, the takeaway here that I want everyone to think about in your strategies is it, is it is not about the percent fly ash. I showed that on that previous slide. It's kind of the old way that people have thought about, you know, environmentally optimizing concrete. But um, we've also been tracking our mixes as they come in. Part of what we've been doing just to understand where the carbon's coming from in our buildings and everyone, when you start to do this, you say, okay, it's our concrete. Well, what about our concrete? What are we doing about the concrete? Are we part of what's causing, are we driving the embodied carbon for the concrete or somebody else? But to do that, we have to start to measure. So um, in looking at the mixes, and this is about 500 that have come in through different regions and different areas of our, our firm. Um, if we were to you know, take data and make plots, but if we look at uh, GWP against the uh, percent of binder that's an SCM, either flash or slag, there's a whole lot of scatter here. But if we were to look at those mixes based on a GWP against just cement content per yard, there's a much, much tighter line. So I share that um, and hopeful, and I, I share that and hope that you know everyone as we move forward and as we talk about concrete can really move to a discussion of functional equivalence and embodied carbon per yard, per yard or meter. I mean, and move away from this kind of percent ash because there's many different ways that you can get there. Here we see the, uh, the tally comparisons for this building. It's a concrete building in a seismic zone. So again, concrete was a very, very large portion of this. Uh, again, it was a collaborative uh, discussion with um, the ready mix supplier here, National, and also the concrete sub uh, as far as how we could get reductions. But the story here really comes back to British Columbia and um, what we had done on some other larger projects in Southern California, but not yet on kind of a 100,000 square foot uh, office building, is to use the ORCA aggregate that's uh, being uh, mined in British Columbia that's much higher quality than the locally available soft aggregates from Southern California. And you might think, well, that, that has a, a big shipping burden. And yes, it goes a great distance, but if you are to, but you can use LCA, you can extract the numbers and burden those mixes with the shipping burden, uh, which I've shown here in orange, in orange, to show that even though we um, we do have uh, you know a good bit of smog that was kicked up from the shipping, but a, a carbon impact from the shipping, it still uh, doesn't overtake or it's still a net gain based on the cement optimization and the mix optimization that was able to be uh, achieved through the stiffer. Uh, stiffer aggregate with paste. So there's the, the project at the end with some of the uh, external circulation and the exposed concrete. And finally, I'll close with an example from Texas. Uh, this is the Woodlands of Suburban Houston, but this is an environmental research group. Uh, the Houston Advanced Research uh, Center, they uh, built a new headquarters about five years ago. It's fairly small, 20,000 square feet. It's achieved lead platinum. It is a net zero energy building certified by ILFI last spring. And as a group that does environmental research, they were very interested in carbon and embodied carbon. So it was um, fun to be, I was the engineer of record and did the LCA for this. Uh, it was very interesting to have PhDs doing LCAs asking about uh, the LCA numbers as we did this. But um, you know, their idea was to consider both operational and embodied impacts to the project uh, on a nonprofit's budget and figuring out where they could get their bang for the buck. So they didn't get their ILFI certification uh, right off the bat or even after their first year, it was a couple of years in. And this picture of the roof uh, kind of illustrates that in that if you look at the PV panels, you see there's two different types. So what they did was they started with a modest array and then they waited till they could um, get, found it to be more financially advantageous to, to build out their array and become net positive. The important thing is we think about operations and uh, net zero and uh, carbon, a lot of people think that net zero means that your cumulative emissions kind of bounce around zero, but, but average out to zero. And that is true for the operational emissions. But really, you know, we all uh, understand that there's this first step function that happens when the building opens from the uh, embodied carbon. Um, it's not exactly a step that builds up over time, but this is what arc at net zero would look like without an embodied carbon reduction. But because we were working for an owner who really cared about embodied carbon, was interested, we did a number of different things to uh, achieve what was 
basically a 20% reduction for this project. Uh, what I think is interesting here before we get into the structural part, but from our tally run is, you know, the, the amount of pink that we see here, which is the insulation, which in a hot, humid climate like Houston, there was a lot of insulation in that building to achieve net zero. So we see how um, you know, the, the envelope on this one actually played a big part. But the comparisons in the studies we did for this one, I'll kind of speak about as we look at this uh, ex exterior shot before the skin went on. Um, this is a, a project that in this area would almost undoubtedly be a what we call a tilt wall or a concrete bearing wall perimeter with a single line of columns down the middle. Um, that creates, uh, that's very cost efficient, uh, cast on the slab and then they tilt it up and drop the beams in, but it does have a vertical joint uh, at every panel, every 20 give or so feet. Um, and it's a good bit of concrete that requires piers and then um, additional support underneath it. So one structural move that we made very, very early was to explore steel frame structure. And that steel frame structure, we were able to cantilever off of out to the back side of the slab edge, um, take the girders kind of front to back here and go from three lines of columns to two lines of columns. And the reality with, those found, with the foundations and this soil here was that these were foundations that were mostly dominated by the depth we needed to go to get to a good bearing strata, not an area like a spread footing. So we sort of um, came back to having two thirds of the volume of concrete in the foundations because of what was governing the design of that. Then the other pieces of the cantilever, we cranked some end moments into those beams. So we were able to uh, you know, skinny those down a little bit. Uh, the cantilever also allowed the cold form studs at the outside of the building to not be broken, but to span up and to get some continuity there. And then there were benefits for this envelope that we had a, a minimal number of joints that helped to be really, really tight uh, as well. So all of these things that um, kind of uh, flowed off of just exploration with the structural system early on to get to kind of, this is the, the current carbon over time tracking that we're seeing. So they did, um, you know, we got about that 20% reduction in the body carbon. Uh, I'm showing an uptick here based on the uh, energy consumption before the PV was on, but the reality was they were buying uh, green power. So we could debate whether that went up or stayed flat, but now they are renew, uh, they're generating a surplus even prior to COVID. Um, so they're on this downward slope and really looking at when they're gonna get back to um, say paying back their embodied carbon. But if you want to do this and you want uh, carbon to be a design metric, it's important that we start at the concept phase or the SD phase and we start kicking around those ideas and looking at um, things like, you know, grids and base spacings and schemes and what we can do. We can make benefit throughout all these different stages. But um, like anything, as we get further through, it becomes um, harder and harder to affect that change. Uh, and here's the uh, final picture at night. So you might say, this is all new. Where do we start? You know, Dirk, I haven't used Tally. What can I do? Um, and that's where uh, Lauren mentioned Ecom. And Ecom is a tool that I, if you've got two monitors here while you're listening to me, uh, I won't be offended if you go over and go to the SE2050 page and pull it up. But it's a super simple tool to let structural engineers understand where the carbon's coming from. It will raise many questions of how applicable is this or but what, but what about, what about, and yes, um, those are questions we want you to raise and we want you to ask those questions so that you do look into the data and um, eventually you know, use LCA tools. So it's a very simple tool and I'm gonna illustrate how a team might use it for a, a very simple steel framed office building. Um, just a normal floor plate, um, corrugated deck, concrete, uh, welded wire fabric within it, and rolled shapes. Um, you know, the hardest part here probably is going to be getting the quantities together, understanding what your quantities are. You know, perhaps you have a, a, a order of magnitude estimate, but um, here we, this, this comes from one of the documents that Lauren showed, but we have our quantities, and it is as easy as just putting those numbers in along with some basics about your square, uh, your square footage, your square meters, your size, and you get a donut chart that comes out. And you can see what is causing the embodied carbon based on whatever choice of assembly you've put in. It is entirely based on 
industry average North American, mostly US, but um, North American EPDs. So it's a first starting point to look at the embodied carbon of your structure. A very easy way to gain comfort with it and see what the, the hot spots are. It will, as I said, raise questions, but those questions, um, you were transparent with the data. Um, you know, we, we look forward to uh, um, people looking into it and people making suggestions. We can't make promises that we're gonna be able to update it right away, but if you have ideas, um, we, we can always you know, keep them in a, in a list. So then in, in closing, I'm gonna talk a bit about what we're doing uh, within our firm for uh, meeting our commitment to SE 2050. Some of this is what we've done um, already. Um, and some of it's what we're working on kind of over the next six months as we get our ECAP in. But for the education pillar, um, we've been doing internal and external education programs, educating both our team as well as our clients about embodied carbon in the role. Um, we also have a sustainable design community of practice made up of engineers from across our firm who are interested in sustainable design. It's a, a great way um, for those, uh, we have about 20 offices now. So for engineers from different offices to talk about strategies and to bounce ideas off each other. Um, reporting, uh, I can't uh, say too, I can't say too many times measure. It is so important to measure, even if imperfect, because you'll, uh, you'll ask questions, you'll learn about where it's imperfect, but you can also manage it. Um, you know, once you start to measure, uh, we're working on that. We certainly have our projects where we're doing whole building LCAs, like the ones I showed, um, that we have the quantities, but we're working on our internal workflows and our modeling practices so that we're uh, able to um, kick out those bills of materials uh, um, digitally much faster. Um, reduction, um, what basically um, we take what we learn on um, our leading or our more aggressive projects and then figure out how to roll that into our quote base specifications and how we can implement it or perhaps implement it in different markets. Everything is market specific as well. So it's very important uh, to do that um, and then add or to consider that. And then finally, advocacy. Uh, we're involved with CLF both uh, nationally and the local um, hubs, which I think is a, you know, kudos to everybody. This great turnout here, a great organization to focus it. We're one of the pilot sponsors of EC3, which has been, been very important for us as well. And we put together an embodied carbon report uh, late last year. So just kind of two of the things that, that we've done showing uh, what we're doing for quantities. We've taken, uh, we've created some Power BI reports based on kind of Ecom-esque uh, embodied carbon numbers for uh, to create visualizations of the embodied carbon over time for our project. So this is a concrete framed hospital, but um, our modelers are dumping out a kind of a, a weekly basis for this project. Quantities as modeled as the design progresses, and then we, we track the carbon. So what we see here is this, this first uh, kind of static point was when we were tracking based on benchmark mixes, then we included the requirements of our specifications and we got these drops. And then uh, as we went on, we got the actual submitted mix designs and they were a little bit higher. We got a little too aggressive with, with one. Um, so we're, we're doing that to visualize and communicate where the carbon is. And then uh, this is just the cover of our uh, embodied carbon report. Every two years we put out a stewardship report. Um, and, and that was that and it's uh, issued in November and on our website if you're interested. But if you are interested in doing more right now, um, we can certainly talk about this uh, in the coming Q and A. But um, SE 2050 has a newsletter that you can sign up for on the website, um, as well as signing up for the commitment. Um, and your commitment letter can be uploaded. Um, and once, as Lauren mentioned, once the commitment letter is signed, uh, firms develop the ECAP. We are US focused right now, but we do welcome all participants. And I think that as uh, more firms are interested in joining, it will allow us to continue discussions or have collaboration. Um, we're having discussions right now between the Structural Engineering Institute, SEI, and iStructe in the UK. But um, you know, we, we do think the possibility uh, exists and would be interested to hear your thoughts about um, what kind of extension or collaboration or what might be appropriate with Canadian organizations as well. So with that, uh, I think there's the Q&A. Uh, 